I've got my high-tech notes here for a start. <laughs> um, I'm going to go first, and then we're going to have Helmuth, and we're going to have Reinhold, and we're doing 10 minutes each. So we're together, a presentation, but we have three different bits of PowerPoint, so it's easiest to do it this way. Um, I have to begin, I've just literally flown in this morning from Madison, Wisconsin, and greetings from the Anthropocene slam there, where we uh, had a marvellous meeting, discovered a new method for the environmental humanities. It's about, um, I'm going to have to do this, I'm sorry. Uh, it's about making objects subjects, giving voice through performance, and if you want to find out about it and you have a Twitter account, it's hashtag AnthroSlam. Um, but basically, this was the, the summary sentence that Bill Cronin came up with in the final panel. We're not all in the Anthropocene in the same way. It's a story of everyone, but not of equality. So when we look at the big A, as I like to call it, because it's a bit simpler for people, um, we start with... Uh, I, these were the images I chose, by the way. The, the Google uh, sources are apparent. Um, we have different origin stories. We start with science, as we have here tonight, and rightly so, because it's scientists that have given us the, the title. And it's often science and technology museums that are taking up the challenge, and I think the Deutsches Museum, the largest science and technology museum in the world, is a logical place for this big gallery, which Helms could talk more about. Um, the other questions, though, of course, is uh, we have uh, different origin stories there. I've just put them up. But also we have the aesthetic of the Anthropocene, and I think this museum has been a great leader in making us think about the Anthropocene aesthetically. My own work is more in the environmental humanities, and I have a role in each of these places. Um, I just wanted to briefly say it's, it's quite interesting to think with a narrative discourse, with literature, with art, with all the senses, not just perception, uh, about the Anthropocene. And I think that as we try and bring our objects to life to give them vitality in museums, we need to go slower. Not to go faster, but to go slower. Um, so the Anthropocene is a metaphor to think with, not just a, uh, a layer in the rock. It's both material and psychological, and it's also, also ethical. It's about particular places and people. It's about the people who create global warming and not the ones who necessarily suffer. So one of the things we like to do in the humanities is start with the people on the receiving end and give them voice, perhaps ahead of top-down um, ways of changing things. We need both, of course. So, I'll just make sure I'm keeping up with my... Yes, we're, we're living in and not fixing a warmer world. So it's about scale. The big A marks an era where we think differently. It has roots in the digital revolution as much as the industrial one. That's the way we scale up and scale down that's possible. But uh, this particular image, uh, this is a table that's constructed of ethic ethically uh, grown timber, recycled material, and encompasses the long now, uh, according to the artist Julie Kennett, who's an, at the art school at the Australian National University. It's also the, the long now, the possibilities of, of time. And I, th I think that Thinking across generations is coming through all the presentations today. Um, we have to make sure we attend to violence that is... This is Rob Nixon's concept. Uh, we have to tend to violence that's too slow to see. Um, Hurricane Sandy got fantastic coverage on the fast media. The a famine in Africa got none, or comparatively little. But it was the one on... Africa that killed more people. It's, if it's too slow to be instant media, that's the problem. We're all looking at what was on the net two days ago in order to work out what we're going to say today, but actually we also need a longer historical perspective. 
So I, the, the parable I like is the idea that the place that the monarch butterfly returns to in California is only known by the great-grandchildren of, the, of the, the one that was there last. So it's four generations. So we have to have a way of transferring our knowledge across generations. We are also talking about objects at a time when we have a great acceleration of objects. In the era of the cabinet of curiosities, which is what we were talking about in Madison, the average European household had 30 objects. In 1900, 400, and now 12,000. So what we have is a, an agglomeration of stuff. Objects are not, are, have a story. Stuff is a problem. And the, I think there's a big difference between objects and stuff, and that difference is what the humanities adds, the stories. Museums are also places of performance, and we're, we're doing one now. This is great, and the only performances that work well are ones that have all you in it. So everybody here is part of this performance. I happen to be up here at the moment, but I'm hoping we'll all get up here. And, uh, and quite a few of the people who saw this original performance are here, actually. This was in the American Museum of Natural History. So just to give you the idea of the theme for our group, slow media is the power of a personal visit of an adult and a child together, often a grandparent and a grandchild together. It's a dialogical space where the objects become subjects, where they talk to each other. This was how it was when I was a kid. Oh, what's that, Grandma? Contrasts with the stress of the great acceleration of global change. So we, we all feel the stress of things happening too fast. And it transfers ideas intergenerationally. So um, it doesn't say that we can't use digital media but it says we need time and space to have personal visits. I also think this module needs to include galleries beyond museums. So we have the concept of a gallery being in a museum, but we can also interpret places. This is Pyramiden in Svalbard, which is a place that is, in some senses, a gallery of the Anthropocene. I can argue about that later, but I'll just show you about it. So the the aim, the, the, at the heart of the idea of the slow, slow media is we're looking at ways of representing, as Van Scherer said at the start, with museums and materials. What can museums do that other things can't? So museums and materiality, the local and the ethical, the particular, and how the public intellectual life and scholarship can come together. So I guess we're developing critical listening skills for the big A. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, my thank yous there. And that's the people. <laughs> you there you go. OK, what uh, I will presenting to you is something that Banchera ca called a place of knowledge production. In a space of knowledge, uh, knowledge production, what we're doing here is to produce knowledge, and I think he burned it perfectly right. That's what we like to do as uh, researchers, as scientists, as humanities people. We want to produce new knowledge and to communicate knowledge. And uh, the project uh, that I'm running through uh, uh, in the next couple of minutes is such a place of uh, knowledge production, but also of knowledge communication. Um, and you might uh, see this project uh, as a manifestation of hubris, the typical hubris of humanity, of scientists uh, in the high modernity, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, uh, to compress all the knowledge what we have, what we have produced in one single space, in one single entity, namely uh, an exhibition. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's an open concept also, what uh, Jürgen called uh, a place of knowledge production in the flux very much participatory. So uh, this slow media uh, 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 course that we are teaching is all about knowledge in the flux. So that's um, the uh, poster of uh, the exhibition. Uh, I give you the, the, main, uh, the, the main information. If, as you see, it will open in three weeks from now. It's a joint project of the Deutsches Museum and the Rachel Carson Center, but it has a number of um, collaborative uh, partners, 
also the Haus der Kultur und der Welt and many, many other institutions around the globe. It's quite a space, it's 14, 1400 uh, square meters uh, and um, the goal of this exhibition is basically to discuss the Anthropocene as a scientific hypothesis and a new way of yeah, looking at humanity's role, human's role on the earth and to strengthen the awareness for the temporal scales and global dimensions of uh, human actions. It's to focus on science and technology in its ambivalence as part of the, uh, of the problem we all faced uh, with, but also as providing potential solutions. It's to highlight new understandings of humans as part of socio economic and ecosystems, overcoming the old nature-culture binary. And it's to provide, what I already said, a, a room, a space for reflection and discussion, an open space, uh, both in the public realm and a platform, platform for scholarly debates. Uh, the challenges we've been faced with is the scope of the topic that what we will be discussing over the next nine days we all uh, engaged with. It's the openness and currentness of a concept which is difficult to grasp in a seemingly manifest uh, exhibition and the newness of the, new, newness of the concept to the visitors. We have done a little survey uh, uh, um, in uh, in the Deutsches Museum, at the Deutsches Museum, amongst our visitors. And not very surprisingly, only 14% of our visitors have ever come across the term. That was in August uh, 2012. I would th think it could be looked differently today after uh, two, three years of, yeah, having been engaged uh, with this topic here in Berlin and at many other places. Um, but if you look closer what people think about it and what they um, yeah, re resonate with, uh, they very much, in a sense, uh, engaged with it. Uh, yeah, you, here you can see something which seemed to be strange, but uh, people, like, people like to engage with the topic. Uh, main messages we want to convey with this exhibition, human beings create the Anthropocene, we are already in the Anthropocene, it's there, its impact is global, long-term and in, uh, interdependent, and humans are an Earth uh, system changing factor. We are Anthropocene, basically. That's the space if it's empty, and that's the space if it's filled, and I, walk you, uh, I will walk you now through this exhibition. Uh, it will start with a kind of introduction, this uh, cube here, and I, um, I'll come back to this. Yeah, okay, uh, that's, uh, again, uh, back to this, okay. That's the, uh, that's the, um, the, the front, uh, front uh, part is the uh, introduction where we will engage with the concept, and then you can see what uh, Jürgen called a kind of manifestation of industrialization of the whole complexity of technological systems in the age of industrialization. This big shelf uh, showcasing, iconic, if you like, uh, technologies of the Anthropocene and its interconnectivity uh, in the age of Anthropocene. And finally, six, yeah, you may call it tectonic plates and all the themes of the Anthropocene, and I come back to this in a second. The introductory cube, uh, cube uh, as it looked in the renderings of the, uh, of the architects and as it looks now or yesterday. Um, and you, I, I won't read uh, all this, uh, you, you may, may look at it. We will provide uh, basically uh, uh, basic information uh, about the Anthropocene in very many uh, languages also. Uh, it's uh, about, uh, again, uh, iconic uh, objects of, um, like here in communication uh, uh, of the Anthropocene. And then as that uh, already said, we, we really look at and uh, showcase objects that cross boundaries. You know, the Anthropocene is all about blurring boundaries between nature and culture, but also between various, in this case, collections. It's, I mean, the Deutsches Museum is a collection, uh, is a classic um, museum of science and technology with all the collections you would, uh, you would await from it, like this Harbour Bosch, uh, apparatus or the Otto Hahn table where nuclear fission was detected and uh, chemicals and uh, other devices like musical instruments. Uh, but then there are different devices like this uh, on the left side, the Vaudian case here, 
which you usually only see in natural history museums, and then other uh, objects like this rabbit here, an invasive species, so to speak. Again, uh, you wouldn't expect it in, an, uh, in a history of uh, science, in a museum of science and technology, uh, and uh, or this uh, this device, which comes from uh, antro social anthropology, from anthropology. So again, here you can see a blurring of the boundaries between different kinds of museums and collections, also. Uh, and even this, uh, this uh, yeah, object of humanity producing coral reefs, artificial co coral reefs. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the clock of the long now has to be in such an um, exhibition because it conveys the different layers of time we all engaged uh, in, in the Anthropocene. It's not just the time we're living in. It's uh, the micro time we're living, we uh, engaged with, and it's the long-term uh, time that uh, we faced with when it comes, for example, uh, 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 with nuclear waste. Uh, what uh, we um, showcase with is six uh, theme islands or tectonic plates. It's, a, it's about uh, urban met metabolism. It's about uh, mobility, the mobility of invasive species, the mobility uh, or the humanity as a barrier to mobility. Third theme we want to showcase here is uh, the human uh, uh, technology interface. It's about a uh, fourth one is uh, on nutrition. A fifth one is on perceptions of nature. And final one, uh, evolution. What we show here always is geological traces. Uh, uh, the geological dimension of the Anthropocene and, and in, a, in that sense bring us back to the scientific hypotheses of the Anthropocene. Um, as you can see here, it's an exhibition in the production that was taken yesterday night. Uh, so still in, in the process of being put together, uh, but we still have three weeks to go, uh, that which, which means that in the end it will be a finalized exhibition. I just provide you, I run you, walk you through a, a few images, uh, showcases um, of that exhibition. Here, for example, it's about pipes, pipes from uh, an ancient Uruk to uh, modern New York, where you see this um, yeah, um, understanding of the city as a, an, as a place of yeah, exchange of matters, exchange of resources, urban metabolism. Uh, then what we also show is uh, the history of, of futures and, of course, the presence of the future. Uh, and in, in doing so, we, in a sense, co um, contextualize images of, of the future. What we, we know, all these iconic uh, images of the 1960s and 70s, when the future was reinvented. Uh, but uh, we also engaged with the younger generation and invited uh, some school classes to come up with their ideas of the future, and uh, their scenarios will also be present uh, in the exhibition. It, it's very much a participat participatory thing, and the whole exhibition will, will be changing during its lifespan of now 15 months, what we expect from it. Um, we also invited um, yeah, experts, uh, persons, scientists, activists, journalists, some of them are in the room, actually, uh, to come up with their answers, uh, what will we be facing uh, in, in the future. And this will also be yeah, a participatory element again, because there will be thousands of flowers. At the beginning, they will be folded in, and, and uh, shown in white. But then we all uh, are invited, so to speak, to come up with our ideas of the future and uh, to garden, so to speak, the Anthropocene. Um, this is my final slide, but before I end, I just wanted to say, uh, again, reiterate an emphasis. This uh, is a project of a, or is a participatory platform, and within the lifespan of the exhibition, there will be many things going on, scholarly events, conferences, uh, workshops, you name it, but also it will engage with the public in, in many, many forms, in many formats, so in that sense, it's like the Haus der Kultur und der Welt. It's a performative uh, theater that invites uh, the, the us, so to speak, to engage within a slow media, a slow change that uh, yeah, changes a uh, current exhibition into something which we still not uh, yeah, 
uh, able to predict because in the end, this uh, exhibition will very much look differently from what we expect today. Is it coming up? Okay. Well, we heard so far a lot on objects and on images on the Anthropocene, and I will continue actually, especially with images. But before I do that, I just would like to remind you that doing science is also working, of course, with objects and images. And in the very simplified way, we have three types of scientists. They are the they are the gatherers, they just collect everything. Think of a natural history museum where they collect all the stuff here, and then they are the tinkers, so they design special experiments, they need objects, or then they, what comes out might be then technical objects and, and so forth, so that they can prove or, or falsify theories. And even the thinkers, the theoretical guys here, they don't do only mathematical calculations and modelings, they have images behind that. And just think of Darwin, his famous, I think, uh, sketch, which, show, which something that this really just triggered the whole development and the writing down then of the whole theory here. So it's a complex thing, we heard a lot of, of that. And of course, a good scientist should do all this and should be in a group, and especially when addressing the Anthropocene, such a complex thing, we do need that. On the other hand, on the other side of the, after the production of the scientific knowledge, the way we disseminate it is often very, very uncomplex. It's very linear. It's in books. You read from, from top to down. You might have some images. What I'm doing now to you is also a linear format. I'm just speaking and you can't simply scroll me back. And the same thing is if you look at a video or so, it's just, it's just running away from you here. It's, it's very, very linear. Actually, our thinking, of course, it's completely different. And especially if we, if we hear of something complicated, there's a very active processing of verbal impressions, visual impressions, and you always uh, sort of um, already compare it with your previously known or your experienced, experienced or your believed uh, knowledge in this all is in an emotional context. You hear me, you see me, and you may, uh, may think, how is this guy acting up there? So there's some emotion here, of course, in the room. And I think this is already an expression how we have it then in the society. The society, as we all know, is also a very complex thing. And that's, what's, that's how science is also then sort of challenge because we have the scientific part of it. We want to sort of deliver it, but there is all that psychological thing, almost like a counterpart, all that, what I just said, the, uh, the known knowledge, the belief knowledge and so forth. And this is all scaled in, on an individual, on a cultural or on a societal uh, scale. So how could we also deliver science and maybe even co-produce science using slow media in still another context. And I would like to come up with comics and just a very few things here. We will do much more than in the seminar here. Just two aspects from the toolbox of comics. You play with pictures, you play with images here. A, a real a, a picture which is realistic, you, you don't have to know, you don't have to learn anything before, you just recognize it, you get the message right away. Whereas writing, as we all know, you have to learn the words, you have to, you have to know about the language here. And, but of course, there's a mixture line here. If you look at these icons here, this smiley here, you already have to start thinking, is this a generic me? Is, is this a generic you or something like that? So you can really negotiate things there. This is just one thing of the toolbox. The other thing is that there is a lot of information or hidden information or information to be revealed between all these panels in the gutters, as we say here. You know what's going on there, that this spider will keep on crawling from one moment to the other. You also easily get the point here, there must have been some problematic situation and then the phone is still ringing here. Or here you might think, well, somebody is doing a world trip and must, that must be the scene, sending photographs back here. I don't think I have to explain what happened here, in between here, party over and well, you see. Um, or you can put together images, pictures, which at first hand, they don't make any sense. So you 
might get some tension and might resolve it later on here. So we did, we try to use comics, especially for complex topics, trying to tell stories, trying to have new narratives here, and I'm just browsing very rapidly through this. You can easily understand temporal scales here, the whole Earth history. You can tell new stories there. You can speak about the great accelerations without graphics. You can just do it in these images here. You can address the topic uh, tipping points, living with uncertainties, as we did here on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, you can understand societal challenges quite rapidly if you just look at these images about ch water justice, for instance, or lifestyle ethics, or legitimations, uh, solar wind, uh, wind parks, etc. And you can have very different levels. You can do personalizing here. You might recognize John Schellenhuber here. You can use metaphors like our feverish guy down in, in the bed here. You can do interleavings like the Industrial Revolution is, is somehow interconnected with what John says and what Obama might be speaking about. This is the next project, another thing. This has to do actually with the exhibition. We had a challenge for the exhibition in Munich. If, speaking of the Anthropocene special exhibition, we should include almost the entire museum, the permanent exhibition. So there are big objects, great objects, which we couldn't push simply into that still big hall here. So what we did, we asked in a participatory way uh, students of the University of Arts here in Berlin to come up with stories, to come up with narratives, and they did their research to a large part by themselves. So this is the story for the object for the satellite, the MIPAS satellite here, and of course this is Super Paul, this is Paul Krusen, the father of the Anthropocene, and we heard already earlier of it, uh, how here science was a problem and a solution for, for the ozone hole. This is the cover uh, for, of a book we are producing with all these narrative stories. There will be about 30, and if you go to, the, uh, to Munich to see the special exhibition, don't miss to go into the permanent exhibition. You will see them displayed all there, all these narrative uh, comic strip stories, or you might then just get the book and, uh, and read them all there. I'm coming to another topic, food. So this image by itself, is maybe a slow medium, at least it would need a lot of time to explain it, and I will not go into details here, we might do this day after tomorrow. This just shows that resources put, being put together to products, be it from, from uh, um, biological resources or uh, abiological resources or energy, they are sort of interconnected worldwide in whatever field of living we have. This also addresses food, and maybe just I use this, uh, this diagram here. Your kitchen already decides the way you influence the Anthropocene, and of course then it's you, yourself, here, which supply type you are, which diet type you are, which household type you are. This sort of uh, defines the, the food circle production here and the impact on the resources and this of course through the anthroposphere has then the impact to all the natural resources so in other the, uh, the natural spheres so in other words you're really at the in your kitchen you have the joystick of globalization in your hand and this is a interesting story to tell, we could try to tell it with such an image, or you do it in a completely different way, and that's what we are trying to do in this project here. We design a completely new kind of uh, participatory intercultural um, comic. We have protagonists in 10 different countries worldwide here, and they, we ask them, how do you eat? Do you know where your food comes from? Do you... Uh, what do you need for cooking and how do you live and, and all these kind of questions and we ask them for photographs so we know that this lady here from Uganda, uh, she needs money to buy just this plastic container and so forth and so this is a big dialogue and then we, we from this dialogue we suddenly uh, find out we don't know anything about this so we start the research on this after this dialogue and, and it goes on and it goes on so it's, it's really iteratively here and then this is an example from Uganda, so the first drawings, they come back to us here, also with artists from the area there, uh, and 
then they get refined and maybe this story and you see Mr. Phosphorus is a, he's a guy who is just crossing all the stories here. He's very welcomed here because he's there in the very fertile volcanic uh, soils of Uganda. So that's the Uganda story here. The Ch Japan story is all on water, on, on uh, overfishing, on water pollution, and, and, but also on dashi. And so, so we have other protagonists here, we have other drawing styles, as you see, and this is just also some sketches here. In Brazil, our people there, we came up with the idea, is it all about uh, culture, body culture, and so they said, no, no, uh, it's, please don't come up with that cliche, but we have something else which you might not know. We do love sugar and we're really addicted to it. So you have a story here, at least that part, you see the Coca-Cola tin, you see the ice cream, and so, so they are co-developing this story here. And we do the research to it, what comes up, or China, a very big story there from famine to the green revolution. So you see here the introduction, how it might come up, the, the storyboard and then the first uh, sketches there. And it, you've seen already this picture here, we try to, we tell them, do you have situations like this? And they say yes or no, and then we uh, keep on developing this. And our persons there, they, and their parents, they know the, the Mao times and then they start speaking about this here and we really do co-develop this here. So, and what we want you to do, or some of you maybe to do, to, de to draw stories there, to develop storyboards. And if you say, well, I can't draw, then I just tell you, you maybe could draw first before you could read uh, and write especially. Uh, and so you see, it can be very simple here. And if you add a little bit of color, it does look already great. So summing up, <laughs> so sum summing up, um, and this is now not only for comics, this is for all slow media. I think we have a big advantage in the slow media because they are permanent, be it an exhibition or be it, uh, um, be it a, a comic format here. And you can put a lot of motivational stuff inside, emotional stuff inside, but you can do the visualization of your, of your scientific results if you want. And they are permanent, but they are not static. So they are very participative in maybe even two ways. You have to actively put all that stuff together in your head. Uh, so that's the reading is already participation. And as I try to show you at least a little bit, you can even use that whole format to develop a participative co-design for knowledge production. This is what we are doing with that food comic here. Thank you very much.